Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Paul Garrison. I'm the sales director here at NIMBIX. I wanted to thank you all for joining us for our Compute 30 webinar, uh, HPC Application Scaling Deep Dive with Leo Ryder. Uh, we'll be answering questions at the end of the presentation, uh, but feel free to type them in in the uh, GoToWebinar panel that should be off to your right. Uh, we'll answer them in the order they come in. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to turn over the presentation to today's presenter, uh, Nimbix's CTO, Leo Ryder. Leo? Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you to everyone for uh, registering and attending this webinar. We're very excited to present the content to you today, so let's get started. So we'll begin with uh, some words of wisdom from uh, our friend Seymour Cray, who, of course, uh, is a major pioneer in high-performance computing. Um, what he realized is, uh, and he said in a very sort of uh, playful way, is that you know, building a fast CPU or building a fast unit uh, is not enough to, uh, to, you know, to high performance computing to, to getting the kind of performance that we're looking for. So the trick is to actually build a fast system. Now, of course, he was talking about everything from memory, you know, memory speed, bus bandwidth, et cetera, but also he understood that in order to get the kind of, you know, performance for the big jobs that we, wanted, we had to run, we had to really focus on scalability, whether that was in, you know, scalable bus, scalable network, interconnects, whatever it might be. In the modern in modern times, of course, scalability extends just as much to software as it does to hardware, given how much software definition there is in, in just about any architecture, but especially in high-performance computing, because uh, a well-architected, you know, uh, possibly heterogeneous uh, compute cloud is nothing without the types of algorithms and, and scalable practices uh, that actually enable the end-user applications. So today's agenda is really uh, just a really quick review of uh, what our Nimbix application environment technology on Jarvis actually is. Um, and, you know, it should be very short, but it's, it's basically a refresher on what we do. Then we'll get into uh, the architecture of our parallel NAEs or Nimbix application environments. We'll go over some application design best practices. We'll look at some API and examples. Uh, API examples and, and other examples, and then, of course, as Paul mentioned, we'll do Q&A. Uh, if you do have any questions while I'm presenting, please feel free to type them into your panel, and we will answer them in the order that they're asked uh, once we finish the presentation. So first, let's talk about quickly, uh, again, refreshing what we mean by Jarvis and NAEs, which is really a platform for high-performance computing applications on demand. So just kind of rewinding to the beginning, what's the thesis, our thesis for HPC On Demand? It has to be cloud-based, which means elastic scale and self-service. It has to provide bare metal performance. In fact, we have a patented technology called reconfigurable cloud computing that enables that, uh, that enables orchestration on bare metal uh, for HPC. And we have patent pending technology for workload isolation as well. And heterogeneity, very important uh, to use the right tools for the job, whether they might be different types of accelerators, coprocessors, different types of CPUs, and of course, different types of interconnects. And we have to support multi-step, multi-platform workflows, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. And the ultimate goal for the end user is to provide ease of use and time to value. So no uh, time wasted configuring infrastructure um, and no complex you know, uh, methodologies to learn, really just more of a point and click uh, and then compute type interface. So first came the Accelerated Compute Cloud, which was the concept of grouping together uh, heterogeneous hardware, distributed storage, you know, whether it's object block or, or file storage, and a diverse set of applications and use cases in the same cloud and making them available. What brought that together and allowed the end user to consume it was called NAC, or the Nimbix Accelerated Compute Cloud. Uh, and this is an API-based uh, uh, mechanism. It also has automatic data movement from different types of, of storage. Um, and it also provides a web portal with responsive UI so you can use your mobile devices to actually submit jobs. And everything comes into the cloud platform, which then basically orchestrates work across all these different architectures uh, and makes sure that the data gets in and out properly out of the cloud um, in a very workflow-oriented, not machine-oriented kind of way. Then we actually introduced to the market Jarvis, which was really just opening up the platform that we had built for uh, further self-service on the platform level, not just on the application level. So really a platform as a service for our HPC cloud platform. 
So together with that come the NIMBYX application environments, or NAEs, where developers can actually develop, test, snapshot, and of course repeat um, and maintain their applications on the same platform, then uh, submit high-scale uh, compute workloads to solve just about any problem, leveraging the codes that they actually put in the NAEs. And again, it uses the same NAC platform underneath to actually do the computation. So it really kind of pushes outwards on one side closer to uh, infrastructure in the sense that, you know, users can actually access the machines more directly to do their work, uh, to at least their prep work or development work. And on the other end, interactivity, where we can also provide uh, 3D visualization and so forth of desktop, uh, you know, workspace type environments to do things like review results or uh, do post-processing on CAE or, or any of these types of use cases. And what enables you know, all of this, again, is the Nimbix application environment, which is a bare metal, um, you know, machine that is provisioned and orchestrated when you actually either choose to do a build or you actually choose to do computation. Um, so you get a full CentOS or Ubuntu Linux environment. You get root access to your environment. And it only takes seconds to spin it up. Um, that's part of our, our patented technology. Um, you get a lot of local transient storage, so you don't have to worry about, um, you know, using slow network attached storage for uh, temp files and so forth. You do get POSIX compliant access to user persistent storage, so you don't need to worry about moving data from a separate service in our data center. Um, it's actually all unified, so, so you can access these files directly. And of course, you get full access to all the underlying hardware, including CPUs, you know, all the RAM, any coprocessor ex or uh, coprocessors or accelerators, if applicable, so GPUs or, or uh, Xeon Phi cards, etc. And of course, InfiniBand, if applicable, and this is very, very key to scaling applications, which we'll get into a little bit more later. Obviously, image management, so you can actually, you know, do your work and then save it. So when you update your applications, you can then save your your uh, NAE back and call it up later, either in a in a development or a batch processing mode. You can cancel if you don't like the changes you've made in the session. You can even clone and create additional copies of your environment. You can use that for versioning or, or just backups or, or even to create new applications. And of course, this all enables, as we've seen in our last webinar, the build, compute, visualize uh, workflow, which uh, in our view covers every, every type of HPC use case that you can think of. So whether it's big data, you know, capture, uh, capture and filtering, analytics, and visualization, that's build, compute, visualize. CAE, uh, pre-processing, uh, simulation, and post-processing, for example. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the build part can be development as well. So you can actually use the build part of the workflow to develop your application, use the compute to actually run it at scale, at a different scale than where you built it, and use the visualize part to actually render the results without having to first download the data off the cloud or move it somewhere else. So now that we've covered, um, you know, just, just refreshed our memories on, on our uh, basic cloud infrastructure, um, let's talk about how we achieve horizontal application scale using NAEs, and we call these parallel NAEs. So first, we had some objectives uh, to deliver these parallel NAEs. First, we wanted to scale primarily the compute step of build, compute, visualize, because we felt that uh, the, the major use cases would be uh, computation or solvers or batch processing at scale. Um, there are other ways to consume this, and we'll kind of get into that a bit, but this is the primary use case. It had to be familiar to HPC users and developers, so we didn't want to reinvent the wheel on how you actually do things. Uh, if you're familiar with things like PBS, uh, you know, these, these concepts are very similar. Um, it had to be a native capability of Jarvis, so we didn't want you to have to go off and use a different technology that wasn't integrated. Um, you know, it had to be something that was just a very seamless extension of Jarvis. And of course, that means API-driven or portal-based, including being able to submit batch jobs uh, from the portal. We wanted automatic orchestration. Again, we are not an infrastructure as a service provider, so uh, we do all the heavy lifting on the orchestration for you automatically, and that's what our, our PaaS and SaaS solutions offer. And of course, we had to leverage the high-performance interconnects uh, that we were going to use for scaling applications such as InfiniBand. The very basic solution architecture of the parallel NAE as you can see here, is very much a master-slave type environment, although that doesn't mean that the master goes off and spins up the slaves. The entire uh, NAE set is, is actually orchestrated and deployed as a set. 
the first uh, you know compute node in that set is actually just by default becomes the master. And we'll get into what that's similar to how it's similar to PBS in a minute. Um, basically, the the uh, all the NAEs have direct access to the NAE image. So if you create an application in a build mode um, and then you want to later run it at scale, that exact same application is pulled from the NAE storage and deployed at scale. Um, typically, these uh, environments are completely ephemeral. Uh, certainly, all the slaves are ephemeral, which means there you can't just save changes made to the actual NAE itself, the actual application, uh, while it's running. But if you run it in a build mode, you can certainly save it from the master. So you can make changes in the master and save it. But in batch mode, everything's ephemeral. So you don't have to worry about any corruption or anything like that to your NAEs. Every time you launch a job, it's in a pristine state. And there's unified access to the user data provided as POSIX shared storage. So you don't have to worry about copying files or, or transferring files from one NAE to another. Although there are some best practices that we'll get into in a bit that uh, you know, suggest some optimizations on that. And of course, everything had to be connected uh, securely, either with InfiniBand or Ethernet, depending on what you select. Um, in the case of uh, Ethernet, or, or in, in the case of InfiniBand as well, um, each um, the entire set of NAEs have SSH trust established automatically, uniquely for that job, uh, passwordless across all the NAEs. So it's it's a very seamless way to to uh, you know to do work. And getting back to how we actually run jobs this way, it's very much like a PBS script. There's multiple nodes in a parallel NAE set. So if you submit a PBS job, for example, uh, on your own cluster, and you tell it to select, you know, uh, four nodes, you're going to get four machines, um, and the script is actually going to run on the first machine, not on all four of them. That machine has a node list available. Uh, there's a variable called PBS nodes when you're scripting that where you can actually, you know, step through and, and query, uh, you know, through whatever's in that file, um, what nodes are in the set. And then most importantly, all the resources start and stop together. So you don't have to worry about, um, you know, once, once your script runs, all that set of hardware is available for work right now. So this is exactly, you know, the, the spirit of the parallel NAE as well, except it's not actually presenting PBS to you. It's, it's doing everything automatically. Very basic workflow is, uh, you know, you have your input data, you make an API call, which actually launches the NAE set. Uh, you, can, you can launch the same NAE in different uh, uh, capacities. So, for example, one time you may launch it with two nodes, one time you launch it with eight. You don't have to change your code uh, to, to orchestrate that. Of course, your code has to be agnostic to how many are in the set, unless you have very specific restrictions, but the infrastructure, the platform, automatically scales elastically to any size that you want without having to go back and, and you know, re-image or create different NAEs. The script then executes, the, the script that you choose, you actually designate that in batch mode, it executes on the master. And then processing happens on the master and the slaves typically. Uh, remember, the master node is going to be the same capacity as all the slaves, so, so the most efficient use is to actually do processing on the master as well. But of course, master actually sets up the work. Uh, so once that's done, then all the nodes can just process the set. Once that's complete, um, our system actually, you know, orchestrates uh, the termination of the job, and the results are, you know, whatever results are created are then available to the to the user on, you know, either for download or for visualization in the cloud. So with that. Uh, you know, with that explained, uh, let's talk about some best practices for um, how you would actually, you know, architect your applications, how you would optimize your applications to scale and perform using Jarvis uh, parallel NAEs. So the first thing that we very strongly recommend is to be stateless. Uh, basically, you know, ideally you're designing for batch mode, so you're not having users just kind of spinning up a set of NAEs and then logging into them and doing things to get jobs going and, and you know, giving them that kind of access. Um, the most efficient way to scale and, and, you know, from a performance as well as, as you know, uh, uh, economic perspective, cost perspective, is to use the batch mode so that a single API call starts and runs the processing and then exits automatically once it's done. This, of course, um, works best when you only have, you know, during processing, you only keep transient state. So you're not off writing persistent state while you're processing. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute. 
the only thing you should be storing on exit is the actual result. Um, you should allow for multiple instances simultaneously. Instances meaning the same user or different users may say, okay, I want to run this parallel NAE uh, on four nodes. And then at the same time, either that same user or some other comes up and spins up another set of that same NAE on six nodes. So what you don't want to do is, um, you know, rely on persistent state because you may have multiple instantiations of your NAE set running in different configurations on the same cloud at the same time. So again, it's very important to be stateless. And also, we recommend that you avoid designing for reentrancy and restart of any type. Um, number one, remember that cloud computing conceptually should be designed to fail. Uh, which means, you know, if you have an infrastructure failure or, or software failure or whatever, <clears throat> um, you know, there, there is typically no high availability guarantee on the, on the cloud system to, you know, restart your job somewhere else. And that's something that you probably shouldn't be or, uh, implementing in your software either. Um, one way to mitigate that, that is to either use larger scale or use more granularity so that you can actually control the processing time. Now, of course, the Nimbix cloud is highly available from a, from a cloud controller perspective, so that you don't have to worry about the API system going down or anything like that. But, yeah, I mean, if a node fails, um, that's something that's just kind of inherent to cloud computing, and, and really it's, it would just be a matter of restarting your job somewhere else. But what you don't want to do is design something that's going to go off and do that because that typically impacts performance and adds a lot of complexity to your application. We recommend that you use scratch space. So we provide typically about 750 gigabytes of buffer uh, cache scratch space per NAE in slash temp, so a very simple way to consume it. Um, depending on you know, the type of data that you're working with, if you're working on small data sets, making many, many passes through them, um, then we recommend that you actually copy the input data into scratch space before processing and you do that across all your your NAEs in the set. Um, that will basically you know just kind of speed up and eliminate the bottleneck of having to go back to user persistent storage to get the data over and over and over again. If your data sets are gigantic then that's usually not a you know an efficient thing or, or a practical thing to do but um, when you can do that it's a good idea and certainly any type of temporary files um, or or you know for both stateless and performance uh, capability uh, reasons, you should be storing them in slash temp and not on on um, you know the user persistent storage. Basically, the user persistent storage is is a shared resource that's network attached. It's fast and reliable, but it's certainly not as fast as or or as as uh, efficient in terms of caching as the scratch space that we provide. So that's what you really should be using primarily. And then we recommend strongly that you leverage RDMA. Uh, which is the remote uh, direct memory access that, that you, uh, InfiniBand provides. So there's three good reasons for this. First of all, it's very easy to program. It's really about just setting up regions of memory that are automatically shared across nodes. The bus bandwidth is, is very, very strong. We use uh, FDR InfiniBand from Mellanox, so you're looking at 56 gigabits of bandwidth. And as you can see from the, uh, the screenshot below, only about two microseconds of latency. So it's tens or even, you know, in some cases, hundreds of times faster than Ethernet. Uh, to do the same thing. And the other thing is that it is secure. Uh, the silicon itself provides what's called R key uh, encrypt or, or uh, authentication directly on the, the uh, InfiniBand cards. So if somebody tries to send the packet that uh, it's not something that you've, you've set up for the application, it basically just gets thrown away. So um, this is really a great method for uh, interconnecting parallel applications. So let's take a look at some examples of how we would, you know, both instantiate as well as consume parallel NAEs. So the first one is, um, let's say we wanted to run a command uh, on 64 cores, which means four nodes. We're using 16 core uh, processors, uh, or 16, excuse me, 16 core servers. So that would be four nodes. So basically, as you can see, it's a matter of selecting the NAE and, and specifying in the command field the actual path to the application to run, and it's something that you would build into your NAE, whatever parameters you want to pass to it, and then it's off to the races. When you specify the batch command below, what, what Jarvis actually does is it spins up, you know, the four, the four, it spins up the NAE on the four nodes, you know, one instance on each node. Uh, then it executes the command that you specify on the first node, which is known as the master. Um, it passes in all the arguments, and as soon as that command exits, 
So that command could be a script, it could be a you know, Python program, it could be a C program, it doesn't matter. As soon as it exits, um, Jarvis goes and cleans up and, and basically stops the job and notifies the user depending on their notification preferences and all these different things, and of course stops billing. So this is a great way to do any kind of processing. So for example, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, image rendering or something like that where you don't need user interactivity, you just provide the data set and then you just let the uh, processing happen across multiple nodes. Here's an example of launching a, uh, it's a, a screenshot from our web portal uh, of launching a 48 core Tor cluster. So we actually have a, an, a, an NAE template that actually becomes a Torque PBS cluster that you can spin up in any capacity and, and then once you're in there you can start submitting jobs within that cluster and all the configuration is done automatically and so forth. The reason we did this is because there is some software out there uh, and you know maybe it's your the applications you've written or applications that you're trying to install on this cloud that actually require a workload manager. So instead of re-architecting the application, you simply install it and, and you have a workload manager right there on the head node to deploy to. Uh, so for example, we have an application from PacBio um, that, that does this, provides a, a GUI interface on the, on the head node and then actually submits work uh, to, its, to its own private cluster that you've created with this API or with this portal. Um, and then that leverages all the all the cores that are associated with that job. Once the you know once you shut down the main um, NAE, then the entire job goes away. And to give you an idea of what it looks like inside the master NAE, so here's an example of you know we've logged in um, and you can see that there's this notes file that actually has a list of all the NAE hosts that uh, are network addressable and are, are already have established SSH trust between themselves and, and between the master, themselves and the master. Um, so you can use that for scripting or for, for whatever you need to just to know which the other nodes are. And then, you know, we're just running IBSTAT to demonstrate that we have InfiniBand connectivity in this node. So on our website, uh, we've actually created a great uh, section for developers. Uh, it's, it's actually platform documentation. So Within the documentation, you have how-tos, you have FAQs, you have reference material, and you have also videos um, where you can go and look and, and uh, you know, really get the details of how to, how to do these things. But, you know, really, a lot of what we talked about here is exactly what you're going to see in the videos and, and uh, very straightforward to start using. So thank you very much. Uh, we're very happy to take your questions now, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and hand it back to Paul. Uh, thank you, Leo. Uh, as Leo mentioned, uh, we're now opening up the presentation to questions. Uh, I noticed one or two have already been entered in. Uh, again, you can enter your questions in on the panel, the, the GoToWebinar panel off to your right. Um, go ahead and put them in. We'll answer them as they come in. Um, the first one we've got is, how does billing work for parallel NAEs? Sure, that's a great question. So basically, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, all the as you know, when you when you look at the uh, actual NAEs that we have in our catalog, they're all priced based on the hardware that you want to, um, you know, on the on the build tab or the visualize tab. So um, you would just multiply the hourly rate times the number of nodes that you that you that you spun up, and that's how we actually bill it automatically. And of course, we continue to bill to the minute. So, for example, if you use the machine type for your NAEs that cost two dollars an hour, and you run the job on ten machines. Um, if it runs for one hour, it costs you twenty dollars. If it only runs for half an hour, we only bill you ten dollars. Uh, and if it runs for fifteen minutes, we only bill you five dollars. So that's uh, the same way as it does for anything else. It just gets multiplied by the scale uh, that you choose. Great, thank you, Liam. Uh, we have another one. It says, "What type of cleanup must be done across all machines in a uh, parallel in a job?" Sure, that's a good question. So. Um, if you're familiar with, with other cloud offerings where you have to actually orchestrate the infrastructure, so there's none of that to do on the Nimbus cloud. Um, Jarvis automatically, you know, board, both orchestrates startup and spin down of your jobs, whether, you know, including your parallel NAEs, whether the, the, uh, the job terminates on its own, so it just exits either with success or with error, or the end user goes and terminates it either through the portal or through API. Jarvis still cleans everything up. So again, you, you really should design your applications to be stateless. You don't want persistent application specific state to be cleaned up between runs. Uh, so you just kind of let Jarvis do all the cleanup. 
and avoid having state that has to be dealt with between runs. Okay, thank you, Leah. Um, let's see, you got one more. Um, do I need to stop all machines um, when a job ends in order to stop uh, incurring hourly charges? Sure. So, no, you don't have to do that, just kind of in the, the same vein as the previous question. Um, Jarvis does all the orchestration spin up, uh, platform spin up and spin down automatically. So if the master NAE exits, so do the slaves. If a slave NAE exits, basically we don't do anything because that may just be part of your design for whatever reason. Um, but there's, there's really no reason for a slave NAE to exit on its own. Um, but if the master is actually terminated by the end user, which they can do from the portal, when you go and look on the, on the, uh, on the NAC portal, um, the, both the login uh, credentials and address as well as the action buttons like terminate apply to the master of the uh, NAE in the, in the parallel set. So once this is actually, if the user goes and terminates it, then the slaves are killed automatically by Jarvis. Okay. So at that point, charges stop. Thank you, Lou. Um, let's go another one. Uh, what happens to my job if I request too many machines? Sure. Um, so the way that our system works, because it is HPC, uh, you know, oriented and HPC based, workflow oriented, um, instead of just failing, we'll actually queue your job in the submit state. Uh, so it'll be submitted on the portal and it'll stay in submitted state until, until the infrastructure to run it actually becomes available, at which point it starts running. So we only start billing from the moment that the job starts running. So if you're, it, it, this actually works fantastic for batch jobs because you don't have to worry about you know, the user having additional interaction. Even if it queues, uh, the job should have all the information it needs to actually execute and exit. Interactive jobs are obviously a little bit different and this may not be you know, desirable for the end user. So they can actually terminate uh, jobs that are in submitted state and not incur any charges. So for example, you know, let's say you, you know, submit with, uh, you know, 16 machines or whatever it is, and the job queues for, because the cluster is very busy, uh, you may decide, well, I don't want to wait around, so what I'll do is I'll terminate it, and of course you don't get billed at all because the job never entered the running state, um, it just sat in queue, and I'll turn around and submit it with eight nodes instead, and you, that's your option to do that, so when it's submitted, you can also terminate it. Okay. Thank you, Leo. We actually have uh, give just one second. Someone's uh, typing a quick question and just finishing up. And uh, okay, um, will all machines uh, used um, uh, for a, uh, I guess a parallel NA job um, uh, have the same capabilities? That's a great question. So basically, Jarvis guarantees that all machines in the set have at least the same capabilities, including CPU cores, RAM, and GPUs. Uh, as well as InfiniBand if any of that is requested. So um, in some cases you may actually get more on a certain machine because you know we, we just had different resource availability or whatever, but you'll get at least, if you request 16 cores, you get at least 16 cores. You request 32 gigs of RAM, you get at least 32 gigs of RAM. Two GPUs, at least two GPUs. So your code can simply assume that the master and all the slaves have the same resources available to them. So there's no need to write code that has to go and detect what's on the machine. You can just make the assumption that whatever's on the master is on all the slaves. Okay. Thank you, Leo. I think um, we've answered all the questions unless there's anyone else that wants to, has any that are out there. Um, we've got about another minute or so left. Uh, feel free to type it in into the question section. Um, otherwise, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, there will be, in case you missed some of them, I did notice some people got to join late and uh, one or two people dropped off and had to rejoin. Uh, we will have a recording of the uh, webinar posted to our website. Uh, it's nimbix.net. Uh, go to Community and then Compute 30 and you'll see an archive at the bottom that will have that. So you'll have that recording available there probably in the next day or so. Uh, again, thank you for your time and uh, look forward to uh, having you all at the next presentation. Thank you, Leo. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, and thanks everyone for attending.